Okay, so hello everyone. Welcome to PMFIS Current Affair Prelim Test Series. My name is Ashish Malik and this is your part number 4 of test number 9. And here we would be discussing the next set of 20 questions in this particular video. And so far, I hope you must have checked out the test series of the PMFIS where you can practice 1000 high quality MCQs at just rupees 499. Do not forget to check it out. The link is given in the description below. Question number 61, which was asked in your test number 9. It is about the Agni 5 missiles. A very important topic, guys, when it comes to the defense capabilities of, of our country. The first name of in the missile definitely comes of the Agni series. Very prominent, very promising uh, missile series that we have. Now, what we need to know about Agni 5 missile, but the question is all based on the facts. So, few things you, you need to know before you attempt this particular question. So talking about the Agni series and Agni 5 series. So recently it was in news because India successfully test fired the indigenously developed its our Aat Nirbhar Bharat self uh, reliant defense venture. So India has successfully tested its indigenously developed Agni 5 missile and the name of this test of Agni 5 was named as Mission Divyastra. So you never know, you may have a question coming individually on this as well. So be prepared for that as well. Now Agni 5 missile, it is, it's a long range missile. Long range is like having minimum 5000 kilometer is the range of this missile. And this is created by DRDO, Defense Research and Development Organization. Agni 5 series is a three stage solid fueled engine. Even this effect is very important. Some missiles are two stage, some missiles are four stage, some rockets are like that. So for Agni 5 specifically you have to remember, it's a three stage but solid fuel engine. That is the principle on which it works. And of course it is capable of carrying the nuclear warhead. So we can deliver even a nuclear uh, warhead, nuclear payload using the satellite. Now interestingly, the latest variant of Agni 5 missile is also equipped with very cutting edge technology called as MIRV. Our Agni 5 has this technology of MIRV. What is MIRV? Multiple independently targetable re-entry vehicle technology. And due to that, it can actually surpass this new modified latest variant of Agni 5 is not just restricted to 5000 km range, but it can actually get into intercontinental range that is 5500 km and even beyond. So now we have increased from long range, now it has become an intercon intercontinental missiles are those having minimum 5,500 5, km range. Talking about the MIRV technology, you never know, you may have a separate question coming on that as well. So this MIRV, multiple independently targetable re-entry vehicle technology is actually the capability that allows multiple warheads to be loaded in one single missile, right? And your missile becomes capable of hitting different targets. From one single missile can hit different targets, all thanks to this MIRV technology. And our Agni 5 is fully equipped with this one technology. And there are very limited number of countries having such kind of capabilities. Now it is only US, Russia, China, France and UK. They are known to have this MIRV equipped missiles and India has now joined this prestigious so very, very important development in terms of India's defense capabilities. Agni 5 clearly is our pride. So here the both statements looks absolutely okay. It's a long range missile, it is. Long ranges are 5000 kilometer kind of uh, ranges. And when it becomes intercontinental, it becomes 5500. Now DRDO has developed it absolutely correct. And yes, it has MIRV technology. Please do prepare the MIRV as an individual technology as well. You may have a separate coming question on that. So here both statements are correct. Answer would be C. The question was comparatively very easy and very straightforward question with both statements being correct guys. Now if you look at the question number 62, which is the term pushpak. Now this is interesting. It has its connection with ISRO. But what is this pushpak? What pushpak? how it relates to ISRO. So you have four, you, you uh, got the four option. Is it a satellite navigation system? No. 
Is it a transfer orbit service? That is also incorrect. It's not even a small satellite launch vehicle. Basically, Pushpak is the reusable launch vehicle. That is very, very interesting and important. A very straightforward question without any issue, without any trouble. The answer is going to be D. But you need to know a lot of things about Pushpak here. So Pushpak, which is also called as Swadeshi Space Shuttle. You, so all these alternative names are very important. So you may have a question coming on Pushpak or you may have a question coming uh, by this name also, Swadeshi Space Shuttle. Actually, this is India's futuristic reusable launch vehicle. Now, ISRO has conducted some landing experiments of Pushpak at the aeronautical test range in Karnataka and that is why this thing has been in news as very very prominent information. Now here the Pushpak is a reusable launch vehicle. Why we are developing a reusable launch vehicle technology? There is a, there is a common sense behind it. Look at this, look at this uh, whole technique guys. So when I say reusable, normally what happens once you launch the rocket, the rocket goes up, uh, you know, it places the satellite and then it becomes irrelevant. In fact, that rocket becomes a space debris. But instead of using that rocket one time, what if I, I make sure the rocket goes up, deliver its uh, a satellite and then come back and we can use the one rocket again and again. That is why it's called the reusable launch vehicles. So now what India is developing is this reusable launch vehicle and this reusable is what you call as Pushpak. Now this is going to be as fast as Mach 5, 5 times the speed of the sound and it is capable of going up as a rocket will come re-enter as a, as a aeroplane. So all these reusable, reusable launch vehicles they will take off like a rocket and glide back like a plane. You can see it is going up, delivering its payload, coming back and coming back as a rocket. And there's a splash down. And you see the best part, guys. Normally, one conventional rocket actually cost $5,000 or more to put one kg payload in, into the orbit. But these reusable launch vehicles can do the same at one tenth price. It can do it the same thing at just $500. So already India is spending 300 crore rupees, India's current annual spend on satellite launches. And we, we are hoping that the whole expenditure that right now India is burning for the satellite launches, it is going to come down by 10 times. We are going to save money 10 times. The prices are going to go down thanks to the reusable launch vehicles. And that's why they are so important, guys. So I hope you, you are now aware of the, of the Pushpak. So remember Pushpak as a name, the straight away question can always be there. Next question 63 is about the Vechur cow. Now why Vechur cow? It was in news very recently. They were on the verge of extinction, but thankfully now they have been saved. They have been conserved successfully. Now we'll tell you the whole context, but Vechurs for with respect to Vechur cow, you are supposed to figure out the correct statements. So few things you need to know why they are uh, in news and um, what we should be knowing about that. So recently, Dr. Sosama Aip, he is a person uh, who is credited for playing a very crucial role saving mature breed from extinction through the conservation efforts. And for his efforts, he won the Padam Shri in 2022 also for saving and resurrecting the indigenous Vechur cow breed. So one thing is clear that it's an indigenous breed. It was on the verge of extinction, but thankfully now they have been saved. The name, the Vechur cow originally belongs to the Vechur village of Kerala. Even this point is important. Now this is a rare, very rare breed of cattle. And as per Guinea's world record, why Vechur is world famous? Because they are, they are the smallest cattle breed in the world and that makes them very very unique with average or uh, average height of say 90 centimeter and weight of 130 kg they are the smallest cattle breed ever to be seen and that's why they have this guinness book of world record when it comes to milk production guys mature cows have one more unique characteristics they have a very lower food intake they are very low maintenance animals but this still gives you 
high milk production they can yield up to 3 liters a milk uh, 3 liters of milk a day which of course is lower compared to the hybrid varieties but what makes them really unique is despite low food intake they are still capable of giving high milk production in that particular ratio also vechur cow milk has something very interesting the milk of this variety has beta casein variety a2 which is considered to be very very important and very beneficial protein or the kind of beta casein that we need very good for our health in fact other than this there is also lactoferrin protein which is found in this uh, vechur cow's milk and that is considered to be antimicrobial antiviral anti-tumor immunodeficiency anti-inflammatory and there are so so many medicinal benefits health benefits that you can relate to this cow and that is why it was so important to preserve it and that's what we did but now if you look at the question with respect to the vechur cows and please do remember the original state that is kerala that is important you may have a question like that also vechur cow indigenously belonging to which of the following state answer would be kerala so yes they have a guinness world record but are they the largest breed no sir they are the smallest breed and first is wrong they have high milk production right but do they need but do they need high amount of food intake for maintenance absolutely not so here both statements are factually incorrect medium level question could have been attempted very easily straightforward information is there that's it right so here answer would be neither one nor two brings us to the question 64 now this question 64 is with respect to the Atal tinkering lab now this is not a new information uh, since the onset of Atal innovation mission the aim mission that we are running to foster uh, innovation and research in the country so Atal Tinkering, Tinkering Lab is almost 8-9 years old concept but now it is asked again so do you know what Atal Tinkering Labs are and wh on what particular thing it focuses I'll come on to that but first you need to know certain things about the Atal Tinkering Labs what is a Tinkering Lab? Tinkering Labs are basically those uh, facilities where you have this culture of innovation you have a culture of curiosity you have a culture of creativity that is why the name is Tinkering Lab. Atal Tinkering Labs are established in the schools of India as a part of Atal Innovation Mission that we, the government of India started with the vision to cultivate 1 million children in India as new Teric innovators. So to boost up the culture of innovation, the culture of creation, creativity, curiosity, for that purpose this Atal Innovation Mission was started where initially it said we are going to create 10 lakh children as innovative children. Objective was simple, we really have to target the young minds. We have to foster curiosity, creativity, imagination in those young minds while also imparting some skills like design mindset, com computational thinking and physical computing. When it comes to financial support of these Atal Tinkering Labs, uh, so government gives you 10 lakh rupees one time 10 lakh rupees are given for the establishment of the lab in the in the school and another 10 lakh rupees for the next five years for its operational expenses sixth class to 10th class school management are responsible for these labs or they are eligible to get these labs in their schools every six to tenth school managed by government local bodies private uh, societies everyone is uh, eligible to establish this lab because ultimately we really have to make our children innovative and talking about Atal Innovation Mission which was started way back in 2015 guys it's a flagship initiative by Niti Aayog even you need to remember that also you may have this question coming that Atal Innovation Mission is flagship program of which of the following ministries and then you have to remember it's a initiative by Niti Aayog to generate ecosystem of innovation and entrepreneurship in our country since 2015 we are working on that way so clearly when I when now you have the options in front of you what are tinkering lab they are not they have nothing to do with agriculture research they are not uh, uh, any government funded lab for research uh, advanced technologies they are not even uh, vocational training centers but the right answer is a right so this also very straightforward easy question because it's a very common topic 
that we have been preparing for many many times no twist and turn straight away question brings us to the question number 65 now this is very interesting and important question which of them following this best describes the chuski gung drunk which was in news recently now this may be giving you a little bit trouble here so what is this chuski gung drunk now this is not an easy option not a straightforward option you really need to be aware of certain facts about that so recently the chuski gung drunk was in news basically it's a tibetan phrase that means land of four rivers and six ranges but it is not in news for some physical relief that is not the case Actually, the name means this, but in reality, what is Chuski Gangdrang? It was a Tibetan guerrilla group that was formed. It was formally organized in 1958. All the rebels of Tibetan, the, those rebels from 1940s to 1960s, those rebels who were fighting against the Chinese forces, first they were supported by American CIA and then later supported by Indian government as well. So we supported these uh, Tibetan guerrilla groups. They were fighting against Chinese. We supported them. And this Chuski Gangdrang was the name of that guerrilla group. And their most remarkable achievement till date, they were responsible for ensuring Dalai Lama's secret escape from, from uh, Tibet to India in 1959. Okay. In fact, when in 1962, Chinese aggression happened over India and uh, uh, especially over the Aksai chain area, from there the idea came, why not we recruit this Tibetan guerrilla uh, uh, group and we, we uh, recruit these soldiers, these rebellion soldiers in our unit. And there the special frontier force was born and establishment 22 was created. And there we included this Tibetan Chuski gang groups rebellions as part of our unit. Right? So yes, it's, it's been a very, very important uh, group. But again, after 1974, then uh, the relations of China and America, they got better and the relevance of this group really declined after that. But again, say it's an important historical uh, thing that, you, that we need to know. So clearly the right answer here is a Tibetan guerrilla group formally organized 1958. So this is, it is not a Buddhist monastic order, not at all Chinese political organization and not at all any conservation group of any country. So. Chuski Gangdruk is all about the Tibetan Gorilla group. Straight away question, very easy to attempt because no twist and turns are there. It is purely based on your knowledge. And in such questions, if you are not aware, then please do not take much of the risk. Question 66 talks about the IRDAI, Insurance Regulatory Development Authority of India. Now, few things are very, very important that we need to know. Like for example, Talking about IRDI, it's a statutory body. Yes, sir, it is a statutory body formed by Act of the Parliament. Which Act of the Parliament? As the name says, Insurance Regulatory Development Authority Act 1999. Absolutely correct. Now, since I'm talking about insurance, it's a financial instrument, no? So which ministry? Ministry of Finance, Nodal Agency of IRDI with the uh, headquarters in Hyderabad. So be careful. Is it Hyderabad really? Yes, it is. But be careful with the locations. IRDI is a 10 member body consisting chairman, 5 whole time members and 4 part time members that is also correct. So very easy question, very straightforward question about IRDI. In fact, first and second are really really easy statements. The only problem you may have is with the statement number 3 because that includes some factual knowledge. But at least you can take a risk in such kind of questions because you know at least two. Third can be solved with some gut feeling, some little bit of risk. Otherwise, straightforward question without any trouble, guys. Right? <clears throat> okay. Now, some, uh, yeah, one more important thing I would like to add on here. So, uh, what are the major functions of the IRDI? Why it was created? Simple. Certify insurance company is one of the primary functions of IRDI. Also, protecting the interest of the policy holders, the consumer, the customers. And also, in case there is any dispute between the insurance company and the customer, so adjudication of the dispute is another prominent function of the IRDI. Brings us to the question number 67. Now this is your tech. It is going to test your tech knowledge. Here the three things were, uh, were asked. One, relate to virtual reality, augmented reality and mixed reality. It's very, it's, it's, this is talk of the town. And we all, very often we get confused between the VR, AR and the MR. Now, but after, after listening to this question, 
your doubts are going to go away. So let's understand the three. We'll come back to the question. So I'm sure you must have seen people putting those VR gears, you know, on, on their in front of their eyes, something like that. I'm sure you all have seen these VR gears. Now VR virtual reality means what? See virtual reality means <clears throat> when you are experiencing things through the computers, but they don't really exist. They are purely virtual. It's a pure virtual world. So now if I have put something on in front of my eyes and here I can see, oh, this is a mountain. This is a river of obviously I'm sitting in, the, in my office. There are no uh, rivers. There are no mountains here. But putting those gears make me feel going to take me to the virtual world. So basically the VR, virtual reality, as the name says, it is going to immerse the users in entirely stimulated environment that don't physically exist. That is called VR, virtual reality. And there's something called augmented reality. Basically here, I'm going to overlay some digital information. I'm going to add some digital things in the real world. I mean, there was a, there was a very famous game called as, uh, it was a Pokemon game, no? So, uh, yeah, there, there was a very famous uh, Pokemon game, which was viral few years back. So, suppose, now right now I am in, um, okay, let's say. So, you, you guys must have uh, shopped from Amazon or some online platforms, no? And now there is an option these days. Let, let's say if I am buying a furniture. So, if I am buying a furniture for my bedroom, let's say. So, uh, there is an option where you can actually virtually put that furniture into your room if you scan uh, your you know room through that camera and you are you can virtually you can actually place it online you can place it in your right, real room so the environment is real but i am putting some virtual things just to make them feel so basically augmented reality virtual reality there was, there was no reality at all here there is a real world environment but we are putting something uh, virtually through that. So augmented reality, where you can add images, video, sound, 3D models into the real world environment. That's why the word is augmented reality. You can see here. So in reality, there is no such marking. There are no such informations available. So Google Glass or like, I'm, like I told you, the online shopping, there they give you this option. You want to try 3D, try. There is, a, there is an option called 3D try in your room. So this, this is all augmented reality. But that is, there's a difference between the two. In virtually there was no reality at all. And then comes the hybrid, the mixed reality. It's a technology which actually blends the two, the virtual and the augmented. The two are blended where you can see physical digital objects are interacting in real time. So this mixed reality takes this step further by blending the two allowing users to interact with both simultaneously. For example, one could see a virtual character sitting on his real couch, real place, digital objects on a real desk. If now this is my desk and I can see if I have virtually created some four or five bookshelf here, it's a mix of the two. My table is real, but some objects are virtual. And the best, best of these example, the Instagram Snapchat filters virtual makeup applications you see i'm sure many of you must have used that also or even virtual furniture fitting that i was talking about this is all mixed reality that we are talking about now if you go back to the question the only problem with the first and second they are being interexchanged. so virtual reality is this where uh, real environment doesn't physically exist and augmented reality is this where there is a real world environment so first and second are incorrect. The third is correct here. So it was again a medium level question, but I think we all are quite aware about virtual and augmented. Even if you simply translate the English meanings of the two, you can still, you are, you will be able to eliminate the one and two. So easy question could have been attempted. Uh, right answer here has to be only one. Okay. Now I think you are clear with the VR and the AR and the mixed realities very important concepts you are going to find them very application oriented in today's world next question 68 talks about the prototype fast breeder reactor now this is an assertion reason kind of thing where two statements were given with respect to prototype fast breeder reactor okay the first the, the first statement says 
this is second stage in India three stage nuclear program. We have discussed it a number of times. And this is probably some of the most important topic which is evergreen and you should be completely aware of. India's nuclear program is not a simple nuclear program because India did not have the excess of uranium that time U35 which, which is a fissile thing we, we require for our nuclear fission. So India designed a three stage nuclear program where we started with the normal uh, pressurized uh, water uh, heavy water reactors and second stage of our nuclear program is the prototype fast builder reactors that is that is there and as the name says what is like like just uh, uh, understand the term I am talking I am saying the word fast breeder breeder reactor means what any kind of nuclear reactor which is capable of producing more fissile material than it is actually consuming if it is consumed three unit of nuclear material it is producing five unit this is going to be called as faster breeder reactor and it uses liquid sodium as a coolant in two circuit yes both statements are correct but I'm not going to explain them now first you need to understand we'll come back to the question again so it, it focuses on two things we'll try to learn them so first thing is first recently why it is in news because prototype fast breeder reactor presently being constructed at uh, near Kalpakkam in Tamil Nadu. So be prepared for this MCQ as well. In which of the following states we have recently constructed the prototype fast builder reactor? Answer would be Tamil Nadu. So sometime this straight away question can come. And you know out of the three stages nuclear program of India, where first in the first stage we are simply using uh, uranium 238 and we are converting that into plutonium. In stage number two, we are actually using plutonium with some normal uh, uranium and we are go going to create thorium as a fuel and some other fissile materials and we are also going to create U33 and in the third stage we are mixing U33 with the thorium and finally we are going to get our nuclear results. Now in second stage this is we all are aware of so we are creating the fast breeder this whole this uh, prototype fast breeder reactor is indigenously designed by Indira Gandhi Center for Atomic Research. Now, even this information is very important for you guys. Why? What are free, uh, this uh, fast builder reactors I told you? Produce more fissile materials than they are actually consuming. Interestingly, in fast builder reactors, the neutrons, they are not slowed down. We allow them to trigger specific fusion reactions. Normally, you must have seen that the normal nuclear reactors, they use moderators. Moderators, what is the job of moderator? Moderator are going to slow down the fast moving neutrons. But in fast breeder, there are no moderators. We are, we, are, we are not supposed to slow down the neutrons. We allow them to trigger more and more specific reactions. So how exactly, how does this fast breeder reactor work? In stage one, I told you there is going to be a pressurized heavy water reactor where we are using U38, the normal natural uranium to produce the plutonium 239 as byproduct we are going to feed this plutonium here into the fast breeder reactor with some more u38 and what we are going to get is finally a product which we are going to mix with the thorium in the third stage and yes fast breeder reactors they are not using any moderator you can see there are no moderators <clears throat> but of course they have coolants coolants are very much required because uh, while nuclear energy, nuclear reaction is going place, of course, lots of energy, lots of energy is going to, to be released. So every nuclear reactors, they have some coolants. And here for the fast breeder reactors, liquid sodium is considered to be the best as a coolant in the two circuits. This is absolutely important. And the use of liquid sodium coolant is essential for the functioning and efficiency in achieving the objective of fast breeder reactor. So here if now if you look at the question, both statements are absolutely correct, right? So yes, both are correct. And like I told you that uh, liquid sodium is utilized and that's why the efficiency is there. So both statements are correct also and correctly explains the two as well. Because, with, because, because without coolant, the whole process cannot work. So second is mandatory to get the first result right so answer now this question it was a I would say it was a little tough question why tough because sometimes we are aware of the coolant but sometimes the name of the coolant is going to trouble us but now you know 
the coolant utilized for the fast breeder reactors are liquid sodium try to remember the name you may have a question separately stand alone question coming on that as well it was a tough one but yes at least you know the first statement first one first statement is very commonly known second may have troubled you little bit so rather completely skipping it you can still take a risk in this kind of questions because at least you know the first is correct so you can eliminate option number D because you know first is correct. Now you only have to select the things from 1, 2, A, B and C. So yeah, little bit risk can be taken but with lot of caution. Now that brings us to the question number 69. Question 69 is about the smart meters. Now what is a smart meter and which of the following are correct? Again the assertion reason kind of thing is there. First we need to know about the smart meter. What is a smart meter? We need to know guys. So normally you, you all have seen the electricity meters at our home, uh, the conventional meters <clears throat> and you, you must have seen every month some uh, reading guy will come take the reading of your meter and based on the energy consumed by you, you are going to get your electricity bill. But that process is now going to be replaced. How? In 2017, the government of India started smart metering national program where the government aimed to replace at least 25 crores conventional meters they are going to be replaced by 2022 that was the aim with which smart metering national program was started who is responsible for the implementation of this program it is energy efficiency service limited it's a joint venture of the psus under the ministry of power this information is very important for any mcq uh, that may come on this topic. The whole program was actually implemented under design, build, finance, own, operate, transfer model uh, as a private public joint venture. What is a smart meter? Smart meters allow one to learn about their consumption pattern, help utilities conduct system monitoring and consumer billing without manual intervention. Now, if you have a smart meter at your home, Nobody is going to come here, take a reading. Every month, automatically, your bill is going to get generated. Smart meters are absolutely important in terms of modernizing the way we are, and they are software based. Smart meter, they are going to monitor your electricity in the real time. And smart meters cover all the parameters. It, it includes parameter like voltage, the current, the power, energy. So you are going to know exactly how much, I, uh, like the way I'm consuming my electricity. You can plan better, you can save better by these smart meters. And they will give you, they will also give you a prepaid kind of feature, like the normal uh, prepaid kind of features are there. And <clears throat> again, very interestingly, these uh, smart meters, okay, they are connected, connected to the internet. So basically, being connected to the internet, they transmit the information about the power consumption every 15 minutes or every hour to the utility providers. So here for every 15 to 160 minutes information is recorded in the systems of your uh, electricity provider and that's why the smart meters can estimate effective time of day pricing of electricity means what is this what is this uh, time of day because of this uh, facility because of the real time information storing TOD time of day means differential electricity pricing at consumer end from P cars and the non P cars that is there but remember information is stored or, or transferred every 15 minutes and that is where the question was having some small problem because the question statement number two says that they are going to give information about every five minutes five minutes is too short no don't you think it's too short I mean it's too heavy and it's too impractical that every five minutes information is being stored that's not really practical so based on that even with the common sense you could have eliminated option number two if you would have done that if you would have simply eliminated, eliminated option number two the only option left was option C because it is the it is only one option where statement two is given as incorrect so now my option is C and statement number one is correct so this is purely based on your common sense how every five minutes it's like too it's too impractical right 
So yes, the question, I, I understand the question was a little bit tough for a lot of people, but at least you could have taken the risk. The way I am explaining you with some common sense, why five minutes, it's too short span. So if you simply would have eliminated, you can get your answer as C. I hope that that makes sense to everyone. Now brings us to the next, next question number 70. So question 70 is about the Pritzker architecture price. Okay. And you have to figure out which statement is correct with respect to the price. Now why it is in news, we need to know about the context as well. So recently guys, there's a person called as Rikin Yamamoto. So Mr. Rikin Yamamoto, he is a Japanese architect. And he was awarded 2024 Pritzker Architecture Prize. And this is a very prestigious prize. Why? It is considered to be like a novel in field of architecture. It is, it is, it is of that stature. Now talking about this Pritzker Prize, there is a history behind it. This prize was founded 1979 by a person called as J.A. Pritzker and his wife Cindy. Why this award? Why this prize was started? Pritzker Architecture Prize was mainly aimed to honor the living architects as we have just done with the Japanese architect Mr. Rikin Yamamoto. The objective is to celebrate their ability to blend creativity, innovation, social impact in their architectural designs. Every, every recipient is going to receive a 1 lakh US dollar, a citation certificate and since 1967, even a bronze medal is also given here. Has any has ever any Indian won this prize? Yes, sir. The only Indian laureate that was awarded the Pritzker, the Pritzker Prize is Mr. Late Bala Krishna Doshi. He was awarded with this prestigious prize in 2018. So please remember, there has been one Indian who has got this prize. But clearly, Rikin Yamamoto is not Indian. Even the name says he is not Indian and the name Yoko Mata is very famous, uh, gives you the sense it, that he is not Indian, he must be Japanese. So clearly my first statement is wrong, second statement is right. He is not, the, he is not Indian guys, he is a Japanese architect. The only Indian is Balakrishnan Doshi. This, this is what you need to know. <clears throat> Straight easy question, straight away could have been the answer. Which statement is correct sir? Only two is the right answer. Now, I, ho I hope now you have got the idea of the Pritzker Prize. That brings you to the next question, which is the Gangetic Dolphins, which is also called as Suzu. Another interesting name, common name is Suzu. They are blind dolphins. Okay. Remember these two, three things. <clears throat> okay. Now, some common things that you need to know, and I'm, I'm sure we all know about the Gangetic Dolphins very, very easily. First thing is... They are not marine species. Gangetic dolphin. Why the name is Gangetic? Because they are found in Ganga river. They are found in Ganga river. Common sense says Gangetic dolphin means the one which are found in Ganga river. Is river a marine water? No. River Ganga, fresh water. So how come the Gangetic dolphin can be called a marine species in the coastal areas? Not at all. They are fresh water species. Very common sense. Similarly, why do I have, why there is no logic, why National Dolphin Research Center to be located in UP, why? Because the majority, maximum number of Gangetic Dolphins are in Bihar, the Bihar stretch of Ganga river. So why we will create any headquarter or research center in UP, make no sense. Absolutely the two things are incorrect. Now, we'll learn more things, we'll come back to the question. This, these two I eliminated with the common sense, guys. So, talking about Gangetic River Dolphin, this is India's National Aquatic Animal, okay? In 2015, there was an MCQ on that as well, which of the following recently declared as National Aquatic Animal. So, uh, Gangetic River Dolphin is India's National Aquatic Animal. It's a freshwater species, I told you. It is found in rivers, not in the coastal areas. Distribution wise, if you look at the distribution kind of thing guys, yes, they are found in India, Bangladesh and Nepal. The distribution is quite wide with IUCN status being endangered. They are not critically endangered guys, they are endangered but still under Schedule 1 of Wildlife Protection Act. 
IUCN status are important, especially you are talking about the National Aquatic Animal of India. So you must be aware, there is no excuse, you must be aware of the IUCN status. Overall, there are four freshwater dolphins in the world. One is the, the Gangetic River dolphin called the Suzu. Again, another species is called the Iravadi dolphin that is found in Myanmar. That Iravadi dolphin is actually marine as well as freshwater. So that makes Iravadi dolphin really, really unique. And then we have Indus River dolphin in Pakistan, Amazon River dolphin in South America, but all of them are freshwater. Only dolphin which is freshwater as well as marine is Iravadi dolphin. Important. Also like I told you guys that Bihar is a home of Gangetic dolphin. Like more than 3000 Gangetic dolphins are found alone in Bihar. So the research center is also going to be Bihar not UP. Very interestingly one more information for you guys that like I told you, the Gangetic dolphin, the Suzu is blind. They are called, they are blind, uh, uh, you know, dolphins. So how do they navigate? How do they pray? So well, uh, there is an inbuilt system in the Gangetic dolphin and using the technology of echolocation. Echolocation means what? It is the same technique used by bats and dolphins and other animals also. Basically, they always, they based on the reflection of the sound, based on reflection of the sound, they are going to determine the location of the object and other specific things. Just as we, the work is on sonar, the way sonar works, that also works on echo location. So you, you send a, a sound signal, it is going to strike with something, come back. Based on that, they are going to determine the way to navigate and also the prey. So uh, Gangetic dolphins are usually found in turbulent waters. But still, but still they are able to get enough fish for, for them to feed on using the technology of echolocation. You can, you can see this uh, beautiful creature here and you can see how echolocation is working. So they are going to release some signals, they are going to get the signal and based on that the same technology uh, and what, what waves they are releasing the ultraviolet rays, yes. The UV uh, waves are used are released by Gangetic dolphins. Okay, this is absolutely important guys. And they have a lifespan of say 18 to 22 years. That is the lifespan with endangered being the IUCN status. Of course, there are many, many threats. In India alone, the, uh, you know, the total population is 3500 to 5000. 80% species are found in Indian subcontinent. That is very important for us. Okay. Now, if you look at the question, the only statement which is correct is probably the third one because you have all the wrong information here. So they are not marine sir, they are not in UP and they are not critically endangered. They are still in the category of endangered, not critically endangered, right? So you have this endangered and the critically endangered. So three statements are wrong. This statement was, this, this question was a hard one. This question was a tough one. Because there you really have to take care of many, many facts and many, many information. But the way you could have eliminated, at least you can eliminate some of the statements. You may have a confusion between two and three, but at least first and fourth could have been eliminated with a common sense also. So either you will, you are going to give the answer as only one or only two, which is, which still makes sense. So that risk can be taken here, little bit risk is taken. So, but now the right answer is actually C only. So that one only is the right answer because even the IUCN status is wrong. Okay. So now you, you got the answer as A for this particular question. Next is a very straightforward, very simple question. The question is Nau Sena Bhavan. Nau Sena is what? Navy. In Hindi, Navy is called Nau Sena. So very simple. Nau Sena Bhavan is going to be headquarter of what? Indian Navy only, sir. Very easy. Straight away can be answer. Nausena is not at all Army, Air Force, Coast Guard. Nausena means Navy only. Why it was in news recently? Because for the first time, there's a first independent headquarter of Indian Navy that is being inaugurated in Delhi. Prior to this, Navy used to have uh, operated from 13 different locations. But there was a need to have this one independent headquarter of Indian Navy in Delhi 
and that's why recently defense minister inaugurated now sena bhavan in delhi and that is why it is in the news and now you know the context as well question 73 talks about now the statement is about the two words agre and akshay now what exactly and this is purely current affair based agre akshay are what which statement correctly describes them what is agre what is akshay so you need to know little bit things about here and then we'll come back to the question basically agre and akshay they are anti submarine warfares they are the uh, war aircraft uh, war uh, uh, ships that we have created this is they, they are the latest warships of india they are fifth and sixth number of ship under the project of shallow water craft project which is launched by the garden research ship building engineers of kolkata so overall they are being built for indian navy as the name says so they are our warships and what kind of warship they are anti submarine warships so they are designed for anti submarine operations in coastal water low intensity maritime operators and mine laying operations they are being built by G grse means garden research ship builder engineering limited that company belongs to kolkata and for that in 2019 only the government the ministry of defense has signed the contract over there okay now here without any trouble you will see all the three statements being correct agra akshay two new ship warships by indian navy yes sir they are anti submarine operations absolutely the name is anti submarine and even the builder is correct so medium level kind of question but easy information to attempt guys all three are correct brings us to the next question number 74 very famous type of questions of upsc sites are given the states are given how many pairs are correctly matched point kalimere wildlife sanctuary it is not andhra pulikat wildlife sanctuary it is not telangana pulikat wildlife sanctuary is actually uh, belongs to the state of andhra pradesh and even some part of tamil nadu is included point kalimere is purely in tamil nadu these these are very famous locations very famous locations valmiki tiger reserve yes that is in bihar so how many pairs are correct only one pair is correct is it really difficult not at all they are straight away question very normal fact based question very easy could have been attempted if you have if you have a basic understanding of some map and important locations of india you can simply give the answer so what we need to know about these places so recently the annual wildlife census was conducted at the point kalimere by the forest department that is why it is in news so talking about the point kalimere wildlife sanctuary created 1967 it is located in tamil nadu if you look at the map of tamil nadu on this particular edge you have the point kalimere wildlife sanctuary and this is famous bird sanctuary it's a very famous bird sanctuary of vedaranyam and the thalai nagar forest it is also a ramsar site so in that case 100% you should be aware how many ramsar sites do we have right now in india there are 80 ramsar sites we have so at least you should be aware of the ramsar sites if not all wetlands but you should be aware of these kind of things and very interestingly the point kalimere wildlife sanctuary it was actually created for the conservation of black buck even this information is important for you and it lies in state of tamil nadu now second very famous pulikat lake itself is very famous no every every upsc aspirants are aware of pulikat lake koleru chilka very famous lakes Pulikat Lake Bird Sanctuary lies in that area only. It is the second largest bird sanctuary in India, and uh, this Pulikat Lake Wild Sanctuary is actually shared by Nellore District of Andhra and Thiruvalluvar District of Tamil Nadu because it 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 you can see here it is exactly on the border of Andhra and Tamil Nadu. Again, the Pulikat Lake Bird Sanctuary is also famous for the migratory birds that come here every years. and it is a brackish water lagoon the nature is brackish water lagoon it is the second largest brackish water lagoon in india after odisha's chilka lake now even this information very very important okay and you can see this pulikat lake receives water from rivers like arani river it receives water from the kalangi river you can see river kalangi is coming here and even the swarnamukhi river is there 
So all these rivers are ultimately contributing to the Lake Pulikat. You may have this statement as a separate MCQ altogether. And you, you can see here very interestingly Sri Harikota. Now that is the launch vehicle. Uh, uh, that is a launching place. Sri Harikota is the place from where we launch our space missions. So uh, the Sri Harikota Island which is also used to call as uh, uh, it's, it's a barrier island that actually separate Pulikat Lake from the Bay of Bengal. So Sri Harikota important for ISRO missions and also important for separating Pulikat Lake from the Bay of Bengal. Okay, now in, in important and we already have seen the Valmiki Tiger Reserve I told you it is in uh, state of Bihar and um, this is very famous river Gandak forms the western boundary of the Valmiki wildlife century. And it is the only tiger reserve of Bihar. So it you should be you should be knowing about tiger reserve, elephant reserves, very, very common topic and very important topic as well. Okay, sir. Again, now again we have a separate question coming on point calimer. We just have done the point calimer, but another question is on the same point calimer. Now, what you need to know about it, we'll talk about it. So um, the last point is correct. We just have read about it that yes, it was created for the conservation of black buck. So at least I know one statement is correct. Now only problem is we just have learnt that point Calimere is not in Andhra, it is Tamil Nadu. So first is for sure wrong. And since, since it is Tamil Nadu, so very common sense, do you think, do you, do you see any chance of Krishna river flowing through Tamil Nadu? No sir. It has to be river Kaveri. So very common sense of point Kalimere, the state and the river. So at least I know the first and second are wrong. I know the fourth is correct for sure. But what about the statement number three? We'll talk about that. We'll come first. Let's learn and then come back here. So clearly guys, uh, point Kalimere is also famously called as Cape Kalimere or it is also known as the Kodia Karai. So do remember this local name as well. You never know, you may have a question coming on the local name itself. So Kora, uh, the uh, Kodia Karai or the Point Kalimere, it's a low headland of the Koromandal coast in Nagapattam district of Tamil Nadu. And since we are talking about Tamil Nadu, so this point is located 9 kilometers south of the Vedaranyam delta region of Kaveri river. That is important. And this particular area, this area's antiquity is that there was a time it was famous for the Kodi Kuzar temple built way back in the Chola period as well. So it has this location as a historical connection as well. And it used to be, used to have a Chola lighthouse also because Cholas were famous for their navies, no? And also, one more interesting thing, the forest, the forest of this area, Point Kalimere is also famous for its forests. And the forest of this place is called as Vedaranyam forest. It is one of the last remnants of the dry evergreen forest which once used to be part of eastern Deccan dry evergreen forest ecoregions but now they are just vanishing slowly steadily and they are the last remnants of that. So the Vedaranyam forest very very important forest area. So now at least at least you know you already have learned that first and uh, uh, second are incorrect, fourth is correct, even third is correct here because we just have learned about the Vedaranyam forest. They are the last remnants of dry evergreen forest. Be careful. I am not talking about normal evergreen or moist evergreen or any kind of thing. So be very careful. It's a dry evergreen because see Tamil Nadu, you have a dry evergreen kind of thing. Tamil Nadu doesn't receive, uh, the Coromandel coast doesn't receive the and here and, and also you see there was another uh, hint for you even if you have read it properly the Koromandal coast you know the Koromandal coast belongs to Tamil Nadu not Andhra so your ba basic geographical knowledge could have helped you out so how many statements are correct sir only two are correct medium level question but could have been attempted because the statements are quite straight without any twist and turn and even the common sense you could have um, answered this question brings us to the question number 76. Now what question 76, this is a historical question and you have to identify, you were supposed to identify the historical figure mentioned above. So okay sir, so um, which historical figure are we talking about? 
like he is the person opened first ever school for girls in Mumbai. Number one information. First Indian nominated to Bombay Legislative Council Board of Education. First Indian member became member of prestigious academic Asiatic Society of Mumbai. Involved in founding, he was the he was the one who was one of the pioneers in founding the Bombay Association. Clearly, it's not Raja Ram Mohan Roy. Clearly, it's not Ishwar Chand Vidya Sagar. Only confusion that could be there is with C or D. Nana Jagannath Shankar Seth or Gopal Baba Valankar. The right answer is C. It is Nana Jagannath Sri Shankar Seth, who is rightly called as the modern maker. He is the modern uh, father of Bombay or Mumbai. He is the one who actually modernized Bombay and you can see the list of his works. So straight question without any trouble, easy could have been attempted with the right answer being C. What we need to know about Nana Jagannath Setnath, very important, very, very tall figure in the politics and history of Maharashtra. So Nana Jagannath Seth, uh, Shankar Seth, he was born way back in 1803 into a very wealthy Murkute family of Thane. He was a member of Bombay Presidency Assembly like I told you in 1861. He also became advisor to the governor of the Bombay Presidency in 1862. He was very influential and he is credited to have the first ever school girls, schools for the girls in Mumbai in 1849. He played a very crucial role while establishing the Elphinstone Educational Institution that time used to be called as Bombay Native Institution and he was also founding fathers, founding members of Great Indian Peninsula Railway uh, along with, this, with other members. He was the first Indian nominated in the Bombay Legislative Council I told you and he was also the first member of Asiatic Society of Mumbai and that's why for all this contribution he is rightly got his nickname as the maker of modern Bombay. So very very interesting and important figure in the history of India brings us to the question number 77. Question 77 is with respect to Hindustan Aeronautical Limited for advanced light helicopters called Dhruv Mark 3. Now with reference to the advanced light vehicle Dhruv Mark 3, consider the following statements. That is something you have to be really really careful about. And the question says which of them are not correct. So be very careful with that. So first let's know about the helicopter itself. So this uh, Dhruv Mark 3 helicopters, they are indigenous twin engine helicopters. They are multi-role helicopters. They weigh approximately 5.5 ton. The very interesting feature in these Dhruv heli uh, helicopters is that they have Shakti engine. Shakti engine is what India has made uh, the Hindustan Aeronautical Limited has made itself. It's a it's a pure indigenous engine on which they are based. So, so Shakti engine is a twin. Uh, uh, it is used as a, uh, it is used in Dhruv Mark III. Also, now this Dhruv Mark III it was actually designed for Indian Army and serves many purposes like search and rescue, troop transportation, reconnaissance, casualty evacuation. So dedicatedly. The way Dhruv Mark III is designed belongs to Indian Army. For, for the requirements of Indian Army, it was designed. And again, again, it's not like it is only now for the Indian Army. Of course, it has a maritime role as well. Now, normally, normally the uh, utility wala part was for Indian Army. The normal uh, Dhruv Mark III has a MR range. MR is maritime role range, where it also served the purpose of Indian Coast Guards and also uh, serves the purpose like maritime surveillance, search and rescue kind of thing. So be very careful with that. So here you can see every statement in front of you. It's a twin engine. Yes sir. Shakti engine is there. That is true. But problem here is here. The Dhruv Mark 3 UT utility is for army, not for the Coast Guard. It is for the army. And that's why the statement 3 is wrong. MR is fine, MR is for the maritime surveillance as the name says. So yes, which statement is not correct? Only one is not correct. Was it easy? No sir. Not easy because heavily, heavily fact based question. So tough question. In case you are not aware, you, you, can, you may skip this question 
or take a risk depending on your understanding but be careful because there are multiple chances of question being being incorrect uh, you really have to take care what question is asking all the four statements are heavily based on facts so be very very careful with this kind of question guys question number 78 again very important uh, kind of format so you have got some exercise and some name of the multiple countries involved in that exercise so you have options like i exercise imt trilat c defenders tiger trump samudra Lux, uh, Luxaman. So, of course, which statements are correct? For that, you need to know. You, are, you need to have a basic knowledge. Please remember the name. I, I understand you can't remember each and every exercise, but at least those in the news try to revise them as much as many times as you can. So, first, if you talk about the IMT Trilateral 2024, here IMT is not Myanmar or Thailand. Here IMT stands for India. Mozambique and Tanzania, even they have a trilateral exercise. So many people got confused. IMT must be India, Myanmar, Thailand, but that is not the case. It's India, Mozambique, Tanzania. So it's a joint military exercise, military, sorry, uh, joint maritime exercise. This is also important, maritime exercise. So obviously the navies are going to take part into that. And, and recently we have got a second edition as well, very as recent as March 2024. So, IMT Trilat. Trilat is for three countries, India, Mozambique and Tanzania. Now, if you talk about the, <clears throat> if you talk about the joint exercise, second one. So, C Defenders. C Defenders is a, is a joint exercise between Indian Coast Guards and US Coast Guards. They. And location, very recently it was conducted in 2024, it was conducted on the of the coast of Port Blair under Manicobar. So sometimes even locations become important where the recent additions has uh, taken place. Exercise Tiger Trump is again a bilateral tri-service uh, amphibious military exercise between India and US, not India and Japan. This exercise Tiger Trump major focus is on humanitarian assistance, disaster relief, readiness, interoperability enhancement and again strengthening the strategic partner between the two countries. Then we have exercise Samudra Lakshman. Now this is the one bilateral exercise. The word Samudra itself says it's a maritime. Navies are involved between India and Malaysia. Recently it was conducted of the coast of Vishakhapatnam. So now you have got the answers in front of you. The only problem are option number one and option number three. So Tiger Trump is India and USA sir. The trilat, IMT trilat is between Mozambique and Tanzania. Tanzania is very famous for its clove, clove production. So how many pairs are correct sir? Only two. What about the statement? They are, they are, they are very tricky part. I mean only take a risk if you are 100% sure. Take a risk, otherwise if you have no idea then please skip because you can't do anything in that. It's a pure fact based questions. But try to revise these kind of questions as much as you can. That's the only thing I can say. The next question is on intercontinental ballistic missile system. The name is YAS. Look at the name. Name of this intercontinental ballistic uh, missile system is YAS. Which country has developed this? So YAR doesn't sound familiar with India. Doesn't go well with China because Chinese name could have been really identifiable. Yar looks maybe of Russia or Israel and you know both countries are quite famous in that category. But if I have to pick up one option, I would have definitely picked up Russia because, because when it comes to intercontinental ballistic missile system, Russia is really world champion. Russia has got the one of the best technologies when it comes to intercontinental ballistic missiles. So even if I have to take a guess, by considering the name and intercontinental ballistic missiles, I would have definitely guessed Russia as the right answer. And it is the right answer also. So easy question, straight away you could have answered it. So what is this YAR intercontinental ballistic missile system? So very interestingly guys, so now you, now you know the answer, you need to know a little bit fact also. So YARS is what you all, it is also called as RS-24 or SS-29. So be careful. You may have this question 
by the other name as well. Yar is a common name. It's a Russian intercontinental ballistic missile system. But other names are also important. You may have question coming on that name as well. So talking about the Yar intercontinental ballistic missile system, it's a three-stage solid fuel. Three-stage solid fuel. Remember the same thing I told you about the Agni 5, the very first question of this video. There also we, we discuss a three-stage solid. I told you, no. So majority of the intercontinental missiles, they are based on three-stage solid fuel composition. Right? And again, even the, the same way like Agni 5, even the Yar ballistic missile system, they are also equipped with MIRV, the same technology I told you for Agni 5. So there is very much similarity you can find between Yars and the Agni 5. Okay? Brings us to the last question. The question is, which one of the following best describe the key features, the key features of India European Free Trade Association trade, EFTA trade and economic partnership agreement. Okay. This is very interestingly. So please first let us straight away eliminate option number one. If I am going to do any kind of FTA, doesn't matter India or what, normal common sense, any free trade agreement is never ever going to increase the custom duties. No. The FTA is always going to decrease the tariff and duties between the two countries. Then only you can have a free trade. So the first statement though definitely cannot be the right answer. Increasing custom duties is totally opposite to the free trade agreement. Okay. Okay. As the name says, because see here, here, Europe is majorly associated. With Europe, we do not really focus with agricultural products. India majorly focuses on other products, but not agriculture products with the Europe. For agriculture products, Europe really relies on Australia and New Zealand. They have better credibility in terms of agriculture products than India. In fact, many times, Europe raises concern with the quality of India's agriculture products. So cannot be the right answer as C also. Now only option is, only confusion could be, is it India's first free trade agreement with European country? Or number two, it restricts the intellectual property rights between India and FTA. Now this, this, even this line seems, seems like a little bit negative statement. Why would two countries restrict in intellectual property rights like something like that? So even like, you know, I am simply applying my common sense even to eliminate the option. Even if you are not aware of the statement, which is correct, but at least you now have eliminated the three, the possible and only option left is option number B. So yes, sir, it is the right answer. The answer is right. The question was a medium level question or maybe tough for some people, but you can still take a risk or you can attempt it the way I have eliminated the other options. Now to tell you a little bit more about it, you need to know very important things about the EFTA first. So now why in the news? So very recently, Ministry of Commerce and Industry of India, they have signed this India and EFTA trade economic partnership. And this is India's first FTA with any European country. What is EFTA? The European Free Trade Association is actually a group of four countries, Iceland, Liechtenstein, Norway and Switzerland. So do embrace yourself for a question coming on EFTA as a standalone MCQ. And there you have to make sure you remember it's a group of four countries. The Iceland, Liechtenstein, Norway and Switzerland. Okay. So talking about this. So this is the first time India has ever signed any FTA with any European country. So that again becomes really, really important. It's, it's the news is of high importance. You know, India is negotiating. India is trying to negotiate the free trade agreement with European Union for, for as long as, as more than 14 years. We are trying to negotiate FTA with the European Union since 2010. And so far we have not got the success in closing the negotiations of the FTA. So definitely India, this is a big deal where India signed, at least with four countries, we have got a FTA. The objective is simple. This particular trade and uh, economic partnership between India and EFTA is going to enhance the market access, mutual market access 
going to simplify the custom procedures also going to make it easy for india india and uh, indian companies and their companies to expand business in each other's respective markets where where efta is offering 92.2 of its tariff lines covering 99.6% india's exports so definitely our exports are going to get more market in this way the major focus is the major sector it focuses here so uh, the sensitivity related the pli in pharma medical they have taken while extending the offer major uh, and please remember one thing some sectors are kept outside the purview of negotiation for example dairies soya coal agriculture products they are all excluded because i told you na europe doesn't really believe in the agriculture products of india it relies more on other uh, countries so all these are excluded not included at all okay and also one thing guys <clears throat> why why what is what is the necessity what is the logic behind doing a trade economic partnership with these four countries there is a reason behind it in 2023 India was actually EFTA's fifth biggest trading partner. Of course, the biggest trading partner for EFTA, these four countries, it was European Union, US, UK, and China. India was the fifth one. So we already are getting good trade between us. So why not to make it more FTA? Why not to enhance the trade and let's get more access of each other's products and the markets. So that makes sense, and that's why the news is very very important. So now you have got the answer. answer is b here i told you you really have to be on your toes while eliminating the options make the use of elimination technique with a with a very logical mind so that is all from my side i really hope you have enjoyed this video that is all from video number 4 see you guys very very soon with the next video and till then all the best wishes for your exam i hope you are enjoying and learning a lot from these videos so do give us a like share the videos and do not forget to subscribe our channel and if you really like our hard work then do give us a feedback in the comment section below how much you like this video what was the new part for you what you have learned from these videos do let us know in the comment section box thank you so much god bless you see you guys soon take care jai hind jai bharat